So I'm uh, going to bring the meeting to order, as it were. Um, thank you very much, um, everyone, for um, signing in, connecting, or whatever, joining us in our Zoom webinar seminar. Um, I'm Phil Morrison. I'm the chair of the Northeast of uh, um, branch of the Chartered Institute of um, Arbitrators. Um, I'm delighted to um, welcome you to our annual um, Keating um, Construction Law Update. Um, due to obviously circumstances that I'm sure you're all aware of, it's been a bit of a moving feast um, from when we usually have it, but I'm delighted that uh, we're having it uh, now. Um, and I'm delighted that we can, uh, we had a, almost uh, or more than 500 people sign up to um, sign up to this um, law update. So it just shows you that everybody loves a good construction law update. So I'm delighted to uh, welcome you all. I'll introduce our three speakers who obviously are from Keating Chambers. Um, and um, on reading their CVs, their bios, and looking at the young age, it does make me feel like I have wasted my life. But uh, our first speaker is Harriet De Francesco, who uh, was called in 2018, um, and she specialises in construction, engineering, professional negligence, procurement, adjudication, and international arbitration, and also has lots of experience with the usual standard forms, JCT, NEC, FIDIC, etc. Um, on that, she will then pass on to her colleague James Frampton, who was called in. Um, 2016. He's also a busy uh, barrister um, and advocating a sole and junior council. He's also developing as well as a construction practice, a public procurement practice, which must be very interesting given the current state of affairs with public procurement and Brexit um, in relation to that. So um, then he will hand over to uh, Harry Smith, who was called in uh, 2014, who has, has already um, honoured us with his, his presence in one of these Keating uh, construction updates, so I can recommend him as a speaker. But it's not, don't just take my word, it. Legal 500 says he's a rising star, his written advice is stellar, um, he's got lots of experience in adjudication hearings, so we all are enforcement hearings, so we all like to have our adjudication awards in force, so that's great. Um, he has lots of other experience in construction and related matters. So um, the our Colleagues from Keating Chambers are going to speak roughly about 50 minutes to an hour, and then we'll have um, a few questions after that. So if you could put the questions in the chat space and everything, I'll keep an eye on them and um, pick them out um, and see what we can uh, what we can ask the try and stump our uh, colleagues with, or just ask them questions that are the burning topics at the moment. So I'm going to press mute, and then Harriet, if you could take over, please. Hey, thank you, Phil. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Um, hopefully you can all see that. I'll take silence as a yes, I got a thumbs up from Phil, so I'll, I'll go ahead then. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about adjudication and payment under hybrid contracts, and specifically the case of C. Spencer Limited and uh, MW High Tech Projects UK Limited, or CSL and MW. Uh, this was a case um, last year, a Court of Appeal decision in March. It's almost a year ago now. Seems crazy to say that. Um, but yeah, the case is interesting uh, because the issue determined was one which hadn't arisen for decision before. I'm going to d divide my talk up into five parts. Um, talk firstly about what hybrid contracts are and how the Act applies to them, the Act being the the Housing Grants and Regeneration and Construction Act, 1996, uh, and then go on to a brief summary of the facts in CSL and MW. Then the issue for the court in part eight proceedings at first instance, uh, the Court of Appeal decision and lessons, if any, learned from the case. And so what is a, a hybrid contract? Well, by hybrid contract, uh, and many of you may already know, um, but for those who don't, uh, I mean a, a contract that relates to both construction operations within the meaning of Section 1051 of the 1996 Act and non-construction operations 
uh, which are excluded from the Act. So section 105.1 is on the screen there. Um, part two of the Act applies to construction contracts only, uh, and that is, as we know, contracts which relate to construction operations uh, defined by section 105.1. So it, it, in essence, includes everything any reasonable person would consider as construction or, or builder's work, um, from painting and decorating residential homes uh, to the construction of railways. Now, part two of the Act, uh, as we know, goes on to set out certain mandatory provisions relating to payment and adjudication, which construction contracts must comply with. Now, unfortunately, one of the rather unhelpful uh, and some might say uncommercial aspects of, of the Construction Act is the exclusion of the following activities from Section 105.2, which would otherwise be considered construction operations. It creates uh, a contradiction. You know, these construction operations are not actually construction operations for the purposes of the Act. Uh, these exclusions you might see primarily relate to the process or energy production industries. And it has been suggested that the, that the then government um, was heavily influenced by the Goliath employers of those industries, who are now effectively exempt from requirements to make interim payments, give notice as to what payment is considered due, and, um, and importantly, the right to refer disputes to adjudication. So obviously, contracting parties can make express provision for these things in their written agreements, but what they can't do is rely on the Act as importing um, those rights and obligations. Now, to, to complicate matters further, uh, Section 104.5 of the Act, which is on the screen, um, provides that where a construction contract relates to both construction and non-construction operations, the Act still applies, but it only applies to those parts of the contract which relate to construction operations. Now, this can make matters in practice very complicated, particularly where the contractual payment mechanism uh, doesn't comply with the Act, because in those circumstances, the parties will find themselves, often unintentionally, uh, with two separate payment mechanisms, one governed by the contract in respect of non-construction operations, and one governed by the Act in respect of construction operations, or deemed construction operations, construction but not construction operations. Um, it can also apply, it can also make, sorry, um, referring a dispute to adjudication rather difficult. Um, if the contract doesn't entitle the parties to bring an adjudication in respect of non-construction operations uh, in a payment notice claim, for example, where it's not possible to distinguish it from in a payment application between construction and non-construction operations, uh, an adjudic adjudicator might find himself without jurisdiction in respect of the entire dispute. Now, the implications of this presented itself in CSL and MW, and a brief summary of the facts of that case, uh, MW was the main contractor engaged to design and build a power plant capable of processing refuse-derived fuel produced by waste. MW engaged CSL as subcontractor to design and construct civil, structural and architectural works, and, and the subcontract was a a nice standard form of subcontract. The contract price was in the region of £35.5 million to be paid in instalments according to certain milestones. Um, and the subcontract works, as you may have noted, related to both construction and non-construction operations because elements of the work were to be carried out on a site where the primary activity was power generation. But it also included civil, structural and architectural works, which fall within definition of construction operations. So it was therefore a hybrid contract. Now, like many other standard forms uh, for hybrid contracts of this kind, the contractual payment mechanism complied with the mandatory provisions of the Act. It applied equally to both construction and non-construction operations. Now, the contract didn't require the parties to separate out sums relating to construction operations from payment notices. So during the course of the project, the parties only ever identified a single sum in their notices. Now, importantly, um, there was an adjudication clause which only gave an adjudicator jurisdiction to deal with the dispute insofar as the Act, allow Act allowed him to. 
So that means essentially those disputes relating to, to construction operations only. Naturally, uh, a dispute arose over an interim application for payment and CSL referred that dispute to adjudication. Now, MW challenged the adjudicator's jurisdiction on the basis that the adjudicator didn't have jurisdiction to deal with those matters relating to non-construction operations. And CSL's application for payment, uh, its notice of adjudication, and therefore the dispute referred, didn't distinguish between construction and non-construction operations. And, and CSL ultimately withdrew its adjudication. What it then did is issued a fresh application for payment, which allocated a sum for construction operations only. Uh, MW responded to that payment application with a notice uh, which, in time, which didn't um, separate out sums relating to construction operations. It, as it had done throughout the course of the project, only identified a single sum. It claimed a negative balance of almost £7 million and CSL commenced Part 8 proceedings. It claimed uh, that MW's payment notice was invalid because it didn't allocate a sum for construction operations only, uh, as CSL had done in its application for payment. It argued that the words only in so far as it relates to construction operations in section 1045 should be read into all the later sections of the Act, including those relating to uh, the requirements of payment notices. The effect of that interpretation, CSL argued, was that, subject to any terms to the contrary, uh, the Act essentially implies a term into, into all hybrid contracts that the parties must separate out construction operations from their applications and notices uh, in order for them to be valid and compliant with part two of the Act. They also argued that, that this was the practical and commercial thing to do to overcome what, what I described earlier as the, the sort of section 105 contradiction. So the issue for the court in the part eight proceedings was in the case of a hybrid contract, whether a valid payment notice is required to identify separately the sums due in respect of construction operations only, along with the basis on which that sum has been calculated. And this was the question that had never arisen for decision before. Mrs Justice O'Farrell, who was the judge at first instance, decided that parties were not required to do this. She held that where a hybrid contract contained a payment scheme that complied with or mirrored the relevant provisions of the Act, as in this case, and that payment scheme applied equally to both construction and non-construction operations, a payment notice that didn't distinguish between the two it was capable of being valid. She gave four reasons for her conclusion at 57 to 60 of that uh, decision. The first was that sections 111, which relates to the requirement to pay notified sum, and section 110A, which sets out the contractual requirements for payment notices, don't say anything about separating sums due in respect of construction operations. Secondly, there is nothing to prevent parties to a hybrid contract agreeing that its terms extend to the excluded operations. Thirdly, that there's no difficulty in principle applying section 111 because the statutory and contractual entitlement simply operate together in tandem, albeit with, you know, the sort of odd complications that arise in this case. Um, fourthly, where parties do agree to extend their contract terms to excluded operations, this doesn't undermine the Act, but actually helps to improve cash flow, uh, which is the whole purpose of the Act. Now, on appeal, CSL, the, the appellant, argued that the judge had erred in her interpretation. However, Lord Justice Coulson agreed with Mrs Justice O'Farrell, and he was also quite critical of the Section 105 contradiction uh, in the Act, and CSL's argument that separating sons in this way was uh, the practical or commercial thing to do. He commented that the Act already creates very problematic situations um, by firstly distinguishing between construction and non-construction operations, and he hinted that this was more of a political distinction rather than a practical or legal one. And secondly, by applying to hybrid contracts in the way that it does, 
may have been more practical to, to exclude them entirely or simply not to exclude those operations at all. If the appellant was right, he, he said, um, and a distinction had to be made, this would create additional layers of complexity and cost um, not envisaged by the payment provisions of the Act. Now, those payment provisions were intended to create a simple and prompt payment system of payment on construction projects. So finally, what are the practical implications, if any, of this case? Well, um, it will all depend on the terms of the relevant contract is the sort of initial answer. Generally speaking, um, though, if a payee under a hybrid contract wants to benefit from the Act or the scheme, either the adjudication or payment notice provisions, um, well, if they don't have uh, provisions within their contract which, in, which require them to separate them out, they, they may wish to separate them out from the outset um, in order to bring, if they, if they envisage some kind of adjudication, an adjudication on that, uh, on that application for payment. But absent any term to the contrary, the payer is under no obligation to do the same. So this may mean a far more limited scope for smash and grab adjudications under hybrid contracts. Now, ultimately, parties to hybrid contracts, as I said earlier, uh, can agree and should, should seek agree to agree. Uh, firstly, an adjudication clause, which allows them to refer any dispute under the contract to adjudication, but also to agree payment provisions which comply with the Act and extend equally to all activities under the, the contract, so as to avoid any complications of having two separate payment mechanisms. Um, well, I hope that's been at least a sort of helpful introduction to, to payment and adjudication under hybrid contracts. And I'll pass you on now to James, who will be talking about insolvency and adjudication, Fresco and, and John Doyle. Thank you, Harriet, and thank you all um, for joining us, particularly with such nice weather outside. Um, I'm sure you're all wishing you were outside having a drink, but um, we're glad you would join us. I hope you can see see my slides and someone will shout if not. Um, as Harriet said, I'm going to be looking at um, another complicated issue, which is the, the conflict or, or perhaps not between insolvency and adjudication. And that's particularly looking at the, the cases of Bresco and John Doyle from last year. Um, and broadly, my topic, um, my talk is three topics. So firstly, we'll be looking at the history of Bresco from first instance all the way to the Supreme Court. Secondly, we'll be looking at the enforcement cases following Bresco. And finally, um, briefly to conclude, look at the issue of set off in adjudication. So I've, I've set out the basic facts from Bresco on this slide. And the key points are first, Bresco was in liquidation when it referred the dispute. And secondly, Lonsdale didn't wait for the decision. They issued, in effect, a preemptive strike to halt the adjudication by securing an injunction. And at first instance, all the way back in 2018, uh, Mr Justice Fraser granted that injunction, and he did so on the grounds that he held there was no jurisdiction. And this was based on applying um, the insolvency rules, which um, to in brief, make provision that is going to be an automatic set off of cross claims between a company in liquidation and each of its creditors, which gives rise to a single net balance. So, so the logic was the separate construction claims disappeared and there was a single net dispute as to the net balance, which was a dispute under the insolvency rules, not a dispute uh, under the construction contract. Um, so Bresco uh, um, um, I think Pythagoras, who were behind them, weren't happy with this, so they appealed to the Court of Appeal. Um, and alongside other cases such as Cannon and Primus Build, the appeal was heard. Um, Lord Justice Coulson disagreed with Mr Justice Fraser's decision on jurisdiction, so he held, held that the adjudicator had jurisdiction, but he said that was just the start of the exercise. So he went on to then look at utility or practicality grounds, and on that basis, he held that an adjudication by a party in liquidation would generally be an exercise in futility because it wouldn't be enforceable. So despite holding the adjudicator had jurisdiction, he upheld the injunction. So Bresco appealed again um, to the Supreme Court, 
and both the reasoning at first instance and in the Court of Appeal was in play. So Lord Briggs gave, gave the leading judgment and first he rejected the jurisdiction argument uh, and he made basically explain that while practically there is this single netting off exercise, he confirmed the individual disputes still existed. They may not exist for some purposes such as they can't be assigned, but they did um, exist for others. You could have still brought a court claim on the dis just on the disputed construction claim. Then Lord Briggs went on to also reject um, the Court of Appeals analysis that such an adjudication was futile. And it, it's notable that he, the reasoning of the Supreme Court was that the adjudication wasn't an exercise in futility, which means that in principle, you could still have an injunction if you could show that an adjudication was futile. But as a result of this reasoning, the, the injunction was dismissed. So reopening the door for parties in liquidation to refer disputes to adjudication. And there were three key pillars to, to the Supreme Court's reasoning. Firstly, um, an injunction is normally to stop a threatened breach of contract or other rights. As the Supreme Court noted, it's rather odd to see an injunction to stop the threatened exercise of a contractual or statutory right. Um, secondly, the Supreme Court emphasised that adjudication is not just about cash flow. It also often results in the final resolution of disputes and, and Harry be looking at the potential wider impact of that point later. And thirdly, in terms of the compatibility of insolvency rules, it actually could be useful for parties to have a decision of a third party on parts of the account. So, you know, particularly if someone with experience in the construction industry, and it may be either accepted by the liquidator or the other party. Um, what's not to be overlooked in Bresco is that it didn't dismiss the concerns on which the Court of Appeal had reached its decision. It made clear that those concerns which Lord Justice Chadwick had first set out all the way back in Bui, Bui and Dow Jensen 20 years ago remained, but were issues for enforcement. They were not issues for an injunction to stop the adjudication, but they should be considered only at the enforcement stage. Um, because this wasn't a case of enforcement, the Supreme Court's discussion of what would happen is um, limited, but there are a couple of points to draw out. Firstly, it made clear that enforcement would not always refu be refused, uh, and then it gave some brief guidance on when it would be refused or would not be, and that's focusing on whether there'd be a real risk um, that the paying party um, would be deprived of a right of recourse. So obviously that's quite high level guidance, so already since Bresco um, later last year, two cases have um, come forward trying to fill this gap of when will an adjudicator's decision in favour of a party liquidation be enforced or not. Um, and the former, John Doyle, is particularly helpful. Again, I've set out the key facts of John Doyle on this slide. Uh, and the key point is that um, John Doyle, again, was in liquidation before it commenced the successful adjudication. And another decision of Mr. Justice Fraser, the first instance judge in Bresco, um, he set out the principles which would be applied in deciding whether to enforce or not. And I'm going to look at these in a bit more detail. So the first principle is whether the decision resolves the party's financial dealings under the contract. So is it a termination account or a final account, such as you might see under clause 8.7 of the JCT? And this should probably also include a situation where you have multiple decisions resolving the account if you're enforcing um, all of them at the end, so you've reached the, the final landing point. The second principle was whether there are mutual dealings outside the construction contract. And I'll, I'll come to look at that point in more detail later. The third principle is whether there are other defences not deployed in the adjudication. I think in reality that must be the same as point two because it would appear odd if a party could benefit on enforcement if it hasn't raised the defence it could have raised in the adjudication. So in other words, it would need to be a defence you couldn't have deployed in the adjudication, I think, rather than just one you chose not to deploy. Um, the fourth principle is then undertakings or, or security. And this was the main point in John Doyle. And, and that's not just for the principal sum, i.e. the sum adjudicator, decides is due, 
but also for costs, because one of the if you pay out on adjudicated decision and bring court proceedings to recover, one irreversible irreversible prejudice you'll have suffered is that you won't be able to seek security for costs in the court proceedings because you would now be um, the claimant. So in effect, this is the court putting in place security for costs at an earlier stage. And, and factor five it is really the principle to which factor four goes. At one point to note, however, from Bresco is that the Supreme Court said that a final dispute on the claim subject to adjudication was itself a cross claim, i.e. there will virtually always be a cross claim as long as the paying party continues to dispute um, the, the substance of what the adjudicator decided. So in John Doyle, Mr Justice Fraser then sought to explain in what circumstances applying those factors a decision would be enforced for, in favour of company liquidation. Um, point one, it is clear that resolves all the different elements under the construction contract. Point two is talking about other contracts or other defen defences. Um, and there's two points to note. Firstly, if they have not been taken into account by the adjudicator, and I'll come back to that wording later. Um, but there's also uncertainty as to what it means when Mr Justice Fraser says those mutual dealings will be taken into account by the court on, summary, on the summary judgment application. Um, the suggestion appears to be that take into account will simply mean the cross claim is accepted and judgment entered on the balance. Now that may be fine if your claim is for £100,000 and the cross claim is for five, but what about if your cross claim is for £95,000? Is a bare allegation of the cross claim going to be enough to reduce the sum payable to £5,000? If we go back to slide nine, we can see um, paragraph 65, the end, um, Lord Justice Briggs obviously, rather obviously makes clear that um, you know, if a, a bare allegation with no substance is not going to do so. However, um, I'm not sure of an enforcement hearing in the TCC can sensibly become in effect a summary judgment hearing of an unmade cross claim, particularly if it's not a construction cross claim. And point three, the real risk was then the issue focused on in John Doyle, and that's having some financial security for the, the sum you're paying, but also your costs. And John Doyle itself had a detailed discussion of letters of credit and ATE insurance on, on that point, which, which I won't go into. Um, but based on the findings on this slide, the court held there was a real risk that ERIF would be deprived of security for its cross claim and therefore refused to enforce. And on factor three, um, real risk, you lose your security. It's also helpful to consider Styles and Wood. Um, this was a case where the claimant was in administration uh, and the claimant had offered to ring fence the principal sum, um, which was accepted and non-controversial. The issue was the security for costs of the subsequent arbitration, and particularly whether the insurance policy offered was sufficient. And perhaps the point to note is the analytical and rather detailed approach the court took to determining what those costs were likely to be. The defendant said its costs would be £800,000, um, whereas the claimant went through almost like a cost budgeting exercise and said, no, the costs are going to be closer to £200,000. And the court um, accepted that and uh, granted summary judgment on the conditions there was the ATE policy at £200,000 and the sum paid over was ring fenced. So it shows that the court will, where it can, apply scrutiny to arguments raised by the party resisting enforcement. It won't be enough to turn up at court and say, well, the referring party claimant is in liquidation or administration. Drawing these threads together, then, if we return to the circumstances in which Mr Justice Fraser said the court would enforce a decision in favour of an insolvent company, I've tried to add up to this slide in bold my brief assessment of where I think we stand. And point one, does it resolve all the elements of the dispute under that construction contract? I think is relatively uncontroversial other than set off, which is the final part of my talk. Um, the second is mutual dealings on other contracts um, will be taken into account. As discussed earlier, 
the lack of clarity as how that will be applied in practice, particularly if the enforcing party wants more than simply the net balance of those other defences. Um, I suggest a likely order, maybe that unless the cross claim is wholly without merit, there will be an enforcement with a stay of execution, giving the responding party a reasonably short period to, to commence proceedings on its claim. Um, to be glib, that would be a, an effective put up or shut up style order. Uh, but then this, that is obviously a key point on which parties and liquidators will need more guidance. As to point three, there already is a lot of guidance. There's um, John Doyle and Styles Wood as, as we looked at, but also there's Medicide, a case before Presco in the Supreme Court, which looked at undertakings which have been offered. So there's uh, plenty of guidance on, on ways you can negate that risk. Briefly then to end my talk, I would like to consider another issue of interest um, arising from Bresco, which seems to require further clarification. And that's the availability of set-offs as a defence in the adjudication itself. So now before the enforcement stage in the adjudication. And I think conceptually it's helpful to think of three categories of set-off. So set-off under the construction contract, under another construction contract, and then a set off, which is not a construction contract or claim. So set off under the con construction contract. I think the position is relatively simple. If you're not in liquidation, then it is available as a defence to a true value claim, subject to normally to the serving pay less notice. Although that is not, there's not an issue of jurisdiction, it's an issue of substance. So the adjudicator would ask, have to ask him herself or himself whether as a matter of law, the set off can be raised. Um, and the global switch case, which I referred to, um, shows the dangers if an adjudicator does seek to limit his jurisdiction by not considering other parts. So in that case, um, referring party sought evaluation of just parts of the account, but also sought um, an award of payment, not just the declaration. Um, the adjudicator held he didn't have jurisdiction to look at other parts of the account, which the responding party wanted him to look at. And the court said he was wrong to do so. Because an order of payment was sought, the adjudicator had to consider um, any part of the account the responding party brought, brought in, wanted to run as a defence. Uh, and it's clear if the referring party is in liquidation that um, it must be considered, other set offs must be considered because you need to resolve the overall financial dispute, otherwise, you're not going to be able to enforce. The second category of set off is more complicated. So that's a set off under another construction contract. Um, taking the position of a referring party in liquidation first, Bresco gives guidance that um, it, it can be dealt with. Um, and it obviously refers to the fact that you can consent under the scheme to um, have more than one dispute. And, and I suggest that if you refuse as a referring party to consent to that, that may be a factor which would justify refusing enforcement because defender can turn up in court and say, well, we, we wanted the adjudicator to decide our cross claim. The referring party said no. But also in Bresco, a suggestion it could be one single dispute when the referring party is in liquidation. Um, pausing there, John Doyle does take a slightly different approach and says adjudicators shouldn't get involved by matters outside of the construction contract. So obviously some further clarification seems to be required um, to reconcile these two different approaches. However, the question I'd ask you to consider, and which is again not entirely clear, is whether a set off under another construction contract could be a defence to a party not in liquidation. Now, paragraph 46 of Bresco does refer to a cross claim. Obviously, that's language of insolvency, suggests liquidation only. But is that right? And particularly two, two possible factors to consider is what is there, what about if there's a set off clause in the original contract? Does the right wording of that clause make the set off a dispute under the original contract or part of the dispute? And secondly, what is the impact of a pay less notice under the first contract? If an adjudication is a claim for payment seeking proper value of the application the pay less notice, is it enough that the set off is brought in to the dispute by the pay less notice? Um, 
the final category then is set offs unrelated to a construction contract. And I think we can dismiss these as set offs outside of a, a liquidation context. Um, but looking in a liquidation context, um, there is a suggestion that in Bresco that even issues wholly out with the purview of one or more construction contracts, again, suggesting adjudicators could look at more than one construction contract. Um, it says the adjudicator will need to have regard to them. Um, that seems to accept they would fall under the adjudicator's jurisdiction. But then goes on to say, um, if they amount to a defence to the disputed construction claim, um, but they may have simply to make a declaration of the value of the claim. So it, it, that is quite significant. It appears to be saying that if you have a non-construction set, non-construction set that may preclude the adjudicator from being able to order payment, should limit any decision to evaluation of the account, not payment, which will obviously, it is two very different types of relief in terms of what can be enforced. So overall, drawing those points and set off together, the thought I would leave you with to, to mull over um, over your Easter break is that based on Bresco, the availability of set off as a defence to adjudication may be broader than you imagine. On the other hand, as a word of caution, much of what is in Bresco, particularly on set off and enforcement, is obiter, and maybe for those of us who are um, construction uh, day by day, um, questionable. Um, so further guidance from the TCC is probably going to be required as to what circumstances different types of set off can be raised. Um, thank you for listening. I'll now hand over to Harry, who's going to be looking at true value following growth. Uh, okay, well, I hope you can all see that and also now me. Um, if you can't, hopefully somebody will will let me know. Um, so thank you uh, very much for that, James, and thank you uh, to all of you for for joining this talk. Um, I have to say that I would I would never have agreed to do this if I had known uh, how sunny it was going to be outside today. So I echo um, what James what James said to you and his hope that you are sitting outside um, enjoying the sunshine ideally in a, a group of six socially distanced with a, a suitable drink in your hand. Um, that's certainly what I'll be doing, minus the group of six, um, once this talk is over, if it's still warm enough. So as you can see, the title of my talk is True Value Adjudications, Where Are We Now? Which is a title uh, and a topic so ambiguous and open-ended that I'm hoping it will uh, I will be able to keep using it for at least a few years more before it becomes redundant and I have to think of a new talk. Certainly it shows no signs of losing its relevance for the moment. So the leading case, as I expect most of you know, is the decision of the Court of Appeal in s and and Grove, which was handed down back in late 2018. And all I want to do uh, in this final section of the uh, webinar is give you first a brief reminder of, of what Grove decided and just as importantly what it didn't decide and what further questions it it raises and then look at what's happened since then where are we now so can i make this work i can the the particular question i want to look at is the circumstances in which an, em an employer will be permitted to commence a true value adjudication um, so that is an adjudication to determine the true value of a particular payment due under the contract as distinct from a smash and grab adjudication as we refer to them colloquially uh, which determines the extent of an employer's liability to pay the notified sum due under section 111 uh, of the act so in snt and grove the contractor snt made an interim application for 14 million pounds Grove issued a pay less notice, so showing a sum due of 1.4 million, so a significantly lower sum. Uh, and the uh, adjudicator found that Grove's pay less notice was invalid and so decided that ST was entitled to be paid the 14 million stated in the interim application. ST uh, applied to enforce the decision in the TCC and Grove responded by seeking various declarations, one of which was a declaration that notwithstanding the outcome of the first adjudication, Grove was entitled to commence a fresh adjudication to determine the true value of the interim payment due to s and under the contract. 
and Mr Justice Coulson held that Grove uh, was so entitled at uh, first instance, notwithstanding the absence of a valid pay less notice. But this gave rise to a, a problem, which is this. If an employer is free to try to overturn the decision in a smash and grab adjudication by starting a true value adjudication, what is there to stop him from doing that without first paying the sum found to be due in the smash and grab adjudication and to thereby uh, dodge the consequences of his failure to issue a pay less notice altogether. And it's clear from the first instance judgment that Mr Justice Coulson, as he was, spotted this problem. He didn't answer it directly, but he did heavily imply that in those circumstances an employer would not be allowed to start a true value adjudication uh, without first paying the notified sum. Um, and so we see that in the three quotes which I've put on the right hand side of the slide. So the first one is that the employer has to pay the sum stated as due and could thereafter, and I've emphasised that word, if they wished, raise the question of the true valuation in a subsequent adjudication. The next quotation, following payment of the sum stated as due, the employer should be able to commence an adjudication as to the true value of the interim application. And then finally, the adjudications will still be dealt with by adjudicators and by the courts in strict sequence. The second adjudication cannot act as some sort of Trojan horse to avoid paying the sum stated as due, um, I have made that crystal clear. Now, whether Mr Justice Coulson really had made the, posi the position crystal clear in his judgment, uh, whether Trojan horse really works um, as, as a metaphor, well, these are, these are things that we can debate. But um, what any of you, what, what he did not do um, was elucidate any legal basis for his conclusion that an employer could not start a true value adjudication without first paying the notified sum. But in the Court of Appeal, Sir Rupert Jackson developed uh, Mr. Mr Justice Coulson's analysis quite considerably. And he said this, and I'm quoting from the, the, the left hand side of the slide now. Both, uh, well, the Act creates, in effect, a hierarchy of obligations. The immediate statutory obligation is to pay the notified sum set out in section 111. As a matter of statutory construction and under the terms of this contract, the adjudication provisions are subordinate to the payment provisions in section 111. Both the Act and the contract must be construed as prohibiting the employer from embarking upon, and I've emphasised those words, an adjudication to obtain a revaluation of the work before he has complied with his immediate payment obligation. Now, um, this reasoning has um, stood the test of time and I think it is uh, at least since 2018, and I think it's broadly convincing. But there is a, a difficulty, um, and it concerns the, the words I've underlined on the slide, embarking upon. What Sir Rupert is saying there is that an employer will not be permitted to start an adjudication to obtain a true valuation of the interim payment until the notified sum has been paid. And it's clear from his language, I would suggest, he says that the Act prohibits the employer from embarking upon an adjudication. Uh, it's clear from his language that he regards this as a matter which would go to the adjudicator's jurisdiction. And it's very difficult to reconcile the proposition that an employer doesn't have uh, the right to start an adjudication in those circumstances with the wording of Section 108 a of the Construction Act, which, as we all know, provides that parties have the right to start an adjudication at any time. And the meaning of those words, at any time, might, um, you'd think, require no elucidation. Um, but for the avoidance of any doubt, the Court of Appeal confirmed in 2005, and this is on the right-hand side of the slide, that the phrase means exactly what it says. And that's a Connex and Building Services Group. And as you can see from the, the quotation, which I'm not going to read out, but the Court also noted that it was apparent from Hansard that Parliament had considered the time for referring a dispute to adjudication and had decided not to provide any time limit. So there is, I think, scope for doubt about whether this particular aspect of S&T and Grove um, in the Court of Appeal is right. On the, the face of it, the more convincing analysis would appear to be that the courts should simply decline to enforce a true value adjudication decision unless and until the notified sum has been paid, rather than place any fetter upon parties' rights to start adjudications. Um, that approach would, would achieve the same objective of upholding the primacy of the statutory payment provisions, but it would do it without doing violence to the words of section 108, 2A, and at any time. 
And in that regard, it is worth noting that whilst the Act is prescriptive about when you can start an adjudication at any time, um, it doesn't say anything about how or in what order decisions are to be enforced. So there is a degree of flexibility built into the, the Act there. And it is, it is fair to say that the analysis, um, which I have just posited, is now supported to some extent um, by the judgment, the first instance judgment of Mr. Justice Stuart Smith in Davenport and Greer, which was handed down in, in February uh, 2019. So in that case, both a smash and grab adjudication and a true value adjudication had already taken place by the time of the enforcement hearing. And the defendant argued that it was entitled to rely on the true value decision to resist enforcement of the smash and grab. And Mr. Stuart Smith, Mr. Justice Stuart Smith, um, rejected that submission. He analysed s and and Grove in some detail. And then he said, he said this, and I've put the quote on the slide, it should now be taken as established as an employer who is subject to an immediate obligation to discharge the order of an adjudicator based upon the failure of the employer to serve either a payment notice or a pay less notice must discharge that immediate obligation before he will be entitled to rely upon, and I emphasize those words, a subsequent decision in a true value adjudication. Now, pausing there, I, I've highlighted the words rely upon because um, they indicate that it's on enforcement that the court will deal with the issue. So the timing that Mr. Justice Stuart Smith envisages here is different to the timing envisaged in Grove. And so whilst uh, the judge did say that he agreed with Saripa Jackson's reasoning in Grove, this aspect of the judgment does mark a departure from what the Court of Appeal decided, uh, because it makes clear, at, at least in the view of this judge, that an adjudicator does have jurisdiction to decide a true value adjudication in circumstances where the, the notified sum has not been paid. There's just a question about how it will be dealt with um, on enforcement. And the, the judge then thankfully dealt with this point head on by saying, saying this, the, the decisions of Mr. Justice Coulson and the Court of Appeal in Grove are clear and unequivocal in stating that the employer must make payments in accordance with the contract or in accordance with section 111 of the amended act before it can commence a true value adjudication. That does not mean that the court will always restrain the commencement or progress of a true value adjudication commenced before the employer has discharged his immediate obligation to see the decision of the Court of Appeal in Harding. It is not necessary for me to decide whether or in what circumstances the court may restrain the subsequent true value adjudication. And in these circumstances, it would be positively unhelpful for me to suggest examples or criteria, and I do not do so. Now, that's um, an important passage. Um, in the law on this topic, because it clarifies that notwithstanding um, the decision in the Court of Appeal in s and and Grove, the court does in fact have a discretion to permit employers to commence and progress true value adjudications without paying the notified sum in some circumstances. And it must follow from that, I would suggest, if both of these decisions are, are, are right or are to be upheld to the extent possible, that the prohibition to which Sir Rupert Jackson referred in Grove is not on analysis um, a matter that restricts the adjudicator's jurisdiction and therefore employers are free in principle to start true value adjudications without paying the notified sum uh, subject to the risk that the court will in its discretion restrain the continuation of the adjudication by injunction uh, later if it is asked by the, the, contract to, the contractor to, to do so. And, and as we've seen, Mr. Justice Stuart Smith leaves us in the final sentence on the slide with an open question about the circumstances in which the court will exercise its discretion um, to restrain a true value adjudication and declines to answer it on the basis that to do so would be unhelpful. Um, well, I have to say that I, uh, speaking for myself, I can't speak for, for, for James or Harriet, but I, I, I would say I get asked about this topic um, probably about well, at least once a month now, I get a set of instructions, which is basically something to the effect of, could we apply for an injunction to stop this true value adjudication going ahead? And I can say that, at least in my experience, it would, it would actually have been quite helpful if Mr. Justice Stuart Smith had, had given some idea of when that, when that uh, discretion might be exercised. It would certainly have given parties um, considerably more clarity than they have now. And I think the present position is that no, no, one, has, no one has tried because nobody wants to Nobody wants to poke the sleeping dragon. Nobody really knows what will happen 
Um, so a bit more clarity would, would actually have been useful, contrary, contrary to what uh, Mr. Justice Stuart Smith says, says there. So that um, brings me on to developments uh, last year. Um, so we have the decision of uh, Brosley London and Prime Asset, which was handed down on the 21st of April last year by uh, Roger Teha QC, sitting as a deputy. And the, the issue about a true value adjudication arose in a slightly odd way in this case. It was an application um, to enforce a smash and grab adjudication decision. But since that decision, the, the contract had been terminated and there'd been another adjudication uh, about that. And the employer accepted in principle that the contractor was entitled to a judgment enforcing the smash and grab decision but argued that execution of that judgment should be stayed for two months to give it time to have an adjudication about the true value of the final account post termination. And the employer argued that Grove did not apply in this situation because the proposed adjudication wasn't about the true value of the interim application, which had been the subject of the smash and grab. It was about a completely different uh, valuation dispute following the termination of the contract. Now the judge rejected that submission and I've quoted the terms in which he did so on the slide, and I won't read out the whole thing, but the, the particular point I want to draw to your attention is the judge's um, argument and proposition that permitting the true value adjudication to proceed would be a remarkable intrusion into the principle established in S&T. It would permit the adjudication system to trump the prompt payment regime. Now that reasoning is curious for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, I would suggest that there's no reason why merely permitting an adjudication to proceed would somehow in itself undermine the statutory payment provisions. Um, it just doesn't follow, particularly in circumstances where it's now clear beyond any sensible argument following S&T and Grove and Dav Davenport and Greer that whatever the precise legal logic might be, an employer will not in practice be allowed to rely on the second adjudication decision to defeat its obligation to pay the notified sum. Um, and the second reason that this reasoning is, is, is curious or perhaps just inadequate is that it, it just overlooks Davenport and Greer. One might have expected the court to cite Davenport, note, note the discretion to, um, to which Mr Justice Stuart Smith referred in his judgment and the discretion to permit true value adjudications to proceed without paying the notified sum in particular circumstances. And then to go some way to answering the open question that we saw at the end of uh, Davenport and Greer. Um, and that kind of analysis is just absent from this judgment. Um, and it really, it, it, it extends the, the slightly unsatisfactory situation, which I was describing a few minutes ago, in which um, client contractors and, um, and employers just don't really know where they stand on this question. And as I said, nobody really wants to tickle the, the sleeping dragon. So, so standing back from that, um, on, on the face of it, this judgment does go some way to extending the scope of the cases in which S&T and Grove can be successfully invoked. It will be, I'm sure, eventually relied upon by contractors who wish to restrain true value adjudications brought by their employers, albeit that nobody is um, showing much stomach for that particular fight as yet, as far as I know. Um, certainly in terms of reported cases anyway, no one's, no one's done it yet. Um, but I wouldn't be inclined to overstate the significance of this case in the sort of broader scheme of things, because the reasoning, uh, as I've suggested, I just, I just don't find very convincing. Uh, particularly the failure to grapple with Davenport and, and Greer just seems to me to, to um, limit the weight with the, which it can really be given as, as, as authority. Um, so where does that leave us? Well, we know um, now that an employer cannot in any circumstances rely upon a true value adjudication decision to overturn the result of an earlier smash and grab adjudication. Um, unless and until it pays the notified sum. That is the consistent message of Grove, Davenport and, and Brosley and Prime Asset. So we, we know that, albeit that the precise legal logic isn't, isn't totally consistent. Um, there is some conflict between the, those authorities about whether an employer is free to commence um, a true value adjudication without paying the notified sum. But the, the better view, as I've been suggesting throughout this talk, is that an adjudicator appointed in those circumstances would have jurisdiction, see the wording of section 10802A at every time, see Connex. Um, but that the court would, would have a discretion applying Davenport and Greer to halt the adjudication by injunction 
on an application by the contractor if it saw fit to do so. When will the court exercise that discretion? Well, we, as I've been saying, we, we don't really know. One hint at a possible answer appears in the Court of Appeals judgment uh, in Bresco. That Lord Justice Coulson approved an earlier case, Twin Tech and Volker Fitzpatrick, as authority for the proposition that the court will grant an injunction if the court concludes that the, the nascent adjudication is a futile exercise. This is an important power in the context of adjudication. And so it might follow from that, that if the court is satisfied that the proposed true value adjudication is a futile exercise, and James touched on this, um, that, a, that an injunction would be granted. But it's it's very unclear how that principle stands after Bresco. Obviously, Bresco went to the Supreme Court and the, and the, the large portions of the, um, the Court of Appeals judgment were, were overturned. Um, on one view, the whole premise of the Supreme Court's judgment in Bresco is that the court will restrain an adjudication. Um, if it will be futile. And as James said, Lord Briggs's judgment is really directed to rebutting the argument that adjudication by an insolvent claimant is futile. It doesn't suggest that a futile adjudication should be allowed to proceed, I don't think. So there is there is a respectable argument that the principle stated by Lord Justice Coulson in, in the Court of Appeal uh, remains intact. But the difficulty is that the reasoning in both Twintech um, and Bresco in the Court of Appeal was based explicitly on the proposition that an adjudication will be futile if the decision will ultimately be unenforceable. That's precisely the ground on which the injunction was granted in Twintech. Um, and of course, that is also precisely the proposition which was rejected by Lord Briggs in the Supreme Court in Bresco in pretty resounding terms. And it's clear on a, a fair reading of the judgment that Lord Briggs did not regard his arguments about the utility of adjudications as being confined to the situation where the, the referring party is insolvent. He was of the view that unenforceable adjudication decisions generally have utility outside the, the insolvency context. Now, I have to say that my personal response to that is that Lord Briggs is wrong, um, but that doesn't help anybody very much because it's a Supreme Court judgment and it is the law. Um, so where does that leave us? It's difficult to know, um, I think, is the answer, when or if the court will be willing now to hold that a true value adjudication would be futile and so restrain it by um, injunction. All that can really be said is that um, in light of the Supreme Court's decision in Bresco, the parties seeking an injunction are likely to find it more difficult to persuade a court that the true value injunction is futile than they might otherwise have done. Um, and I refer you there to the, the quote at the bottom of the slide from Lord Briggs of Judgment, it would ordinarily be entirely inappropriate for the court to interfere with the exercise of that statutory and contractual right, i.e. the right to adjudicate. So um, possibly um, possibly one, old, one, one nil to the, um, to the employers, I think, but we'll see. Um, and so the final, the final case I want to look at, and I can see we're sort of running out of time, so I'll be, I'll be quick, is um, Q Holdings, and Donald Insull Associates Limited, um, which was handed down in July last year by Mrs. Justice O'Farrell. And it involves um, an original argument, albeit a, a doomed argument, about true value adjudications. So it was a dispute about uh, the refurbishment of a private home. Uh, Donald Insull obtained an adjudicator's decision in its favour and a summary judgment thereafter, enforcing the decision in February 2019. Q didn't pay. So in March the following year, um, uh, then sorry, not so, uh, Q failed to pay um, the, the uh, summary enforcement proceedings um, in, in, in February 2019. And then a year later in March 2020, Q commenced its own proceedings against Donald and Sol for professional negligence and, and breach of contract. So that's a, um, worth about two million, so a, a substantial um, effectively counterclaim. And Donald Insull applied to strike out the claim for professional negligence and, and breach of contract worth around two million. Uh, if I had to strike it out or alternatively stay the proceedings unless payment of the judgment sum was made within within seven days. And Mrs Justice O'Farrell refused to strike out the claim but granted the stay. Well, why is any of that interesting? Well, it's, it's because of the submission that Donald Insull um, made. And I've set that out um, on, on the slide. So it said that the claim um, and this is the this is the professional negligence claim brought in the face of Q's failure to pay the the um, adjudication sum. 
the claim has been wrongly commenced without having discharged the payment required by the adjudicator's decision and without having complied with the court's order dated 5th of February 2019. This constitutes an abuse of process and is contrary to law. A paying party is not entitled to commence a fresh claim seeking the determination of the party's true entitlements unless and until it has first discharged its obligation to pay the amounts determined as payable uh, in a prior adjudication. And then there's reference to, to S&T and Davenport, both of which we've, we've looked at. So the substance of this argument was that S&T and Grove uh, not only prohibits the commencement of a subsequent adjudication to obtain a true valuation absent payment of the notified sum, um, but also prohibits the commencement of court proceedings seeking such a determination. So as, as I said, it was a, an original submission, but a submission that was um, unsurprisingly uh, rejected. There were two problems with it, as the judge explained. Um, the first problem is, is one that I've already pointed out really, which is that S&T and Grove was about whether an adjudicator's decision should be enforced. Um, and in this case, the decision had been enforced. There had been a judgment. So on the face of it, uh, s and and Grove simply didn't apply to the, the factual matrix in this case. So the judge said uh, in the first quote, the first paragraph on the slide, this is clear from the, the authorities, i.e. s and and Grove and, and Davenport, that the claimant would not be entitled to start a further adjudication in respect of the defendant's fees on substantive issues not yet determined without paying the outstanding adjudication award. Further, the claimant would not be entitled to rely upon um, any subsequent true value adjudication as a defence to the enforcement of the outstanding uh, adjudication award. Note there that um, the, the, the judge seems to rather gloss over the, the ambiguity in the cases about commence, whether, whether, whether you can commence a true value um, adjudication in these circumstances that we've been looking at. She seems to be willing to assume that it wouldn't be possible to commence such an adjudication. But then she says, those issues do not arise in this case because the court has already enforced the outstanding adjudication award by giving summary judgment. So, so that's that. Um, and if that weren't enough, the, the second problem was with this argument was that in s and and Grove, the question uh, was whether the employer could commence a true value adjudication um, without paying the notified sum. In this case, the question was whether the uh, employer could commence legal proceedings. And as the judge explained, very different considerations apply. So she said, un unlike the adjudication provisions, which are subordinate to the payment provisions in the Act, the right to bring legal proceedings to determine rights and obligations and seek remedies is more fundamental. It was guaranteed by Magna Carta, that it's enshrined in the Human Rights Act, um, and so on uh, and so forth. So, so the idea that S&T and Grove can simply be sort of applied outside the adjudication context to court proceedings is, is just wrong. Um, so that disposes of that argument, uh, and interesting though it was, um, but, it, but it is worth reiterating that whilst the courts refused to strike out the true value court proceedings, which for the reasons I've, I've given, I think is not, not at all surprising, it did grant a stay of those proceedings pending payment of the judgment enforcing the adjudicator's decision. So Q was not in practice allowed to pursue a final determination of the dispute without paying the judgment sum. Um, so that's that, that's, that's the end of my talk. And I don't know if, if we've got any time for, for questions, but certainly for my part, I'm happy to take uh, one or two before you all go off and enjoy uh, what's left of the sunshine. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, I've unmuted myself, so hopefully um, you can hear me. Um, Harry, um, there are some questions um, on the, or two questions in relation to the true value. And I suppose putting them together is really when is the best time to if you get a smash and grab notice of adjudication, when's the best time to start your true value adjudication straight away or do you wait? Yeah, I would. Well, um, I think you're best off cracking on immediately. Um, the problem, it, it, your ideal scenario is, is going to be that you, you get your true value decision more or less at the same time as the smash and grab decision. And then you have what hasn't you, you have a situation which hasn't yet happened where um, you have a um, you have a court hearing where you say, well, look, um, okay, I'm fine. I've I've gone down on my smash and grab. I'm liable to pay whatever it is. But I've, I've the true value of the the payment has been determined. Um, I, I don't actually owe this contractor anything on a on a proper analysis of the payment provisions. And that's that's what the second adjudicator has decided. Um, so please, judge, don't make me pay the sum due under the the smash and grab decision. It would it would be 
uh, it would lack any um, reality at all to make me do that because then I'll just I will just come back to court tomorrow and say right can I have the money back please pursuant to my true value um, adjudication decision so that's your kind of ideal scenario um, and it'd be interesting to see what happens if and when that that arises um, so yeah I would I would I would say get get on with it um, the problem in practice is going to be that um, smash and grab just in the way of things um, you might not be ready to launch your true value adjudication and they tend to take longer to prepare um, and adjudication true value adjudications are, are often take longer just because of the amount of issues that are involved there are smash and grab adjudications are often over much more quickly so you'll be you'll be racing the clock um, and um, yeah so, so but, but certainly I would say if, if you if you want to sort of take this high risk approach and poke the sleeping dragon then the time to do it is straight away yeah, it's uh, as a practitioner, it, it can be quite difficult to advise clients because if they if they feel that they have a chance to have a true value adjudication, then they feel that that's the justification they should they should have their position set out or put before an adjudicator, notwithstanding the um, that there's a uh, that there's a smash and grab adjudication because they, they uh, certainly they would feel that there's a there's a position and that they put them in a better negotiating position is what I'm trying mm. to say. So that's uh, certainly what we're finding uh, um, when advising clients that they want to proceed with it at the very least um, on that um, on that basis. Um, so another question would be um, in under a construction contract, can you um, can a adjudicator only consider evidence which the contractor had submitted to the certifier before the certificate was issued could a construction contract state that could it make those stipulations um well i think you probably could include a stipulation to something like that effect but it wouldn't it, it wouldn't override the provisions of the act so um you, you're still going to have a system of you, you won't be able to sort of contract out of the notice provisions in other words so i don't think that if if that's if the point of that question is, is that a way of avoiding being the subject of an unfavorable smash and grab if I forget to put in a notice, I don't think you could you could contract out of that regime. Um, and I think it also has to be very clear wording because obviously, I mean, NEC contracts often talk about it always being mm. active assessment, um, but there is a Northern Ireland case which has said, well, it may be a prospective assessment, but once we know what's actually happened, the court's going to look at the best evidence, which is what's actually happened. So, you, as Harry says, you you could. It wouldn't stop you being hit with a notified sum claim, but even on the true value, you would need very clear wording, uh, I think, to, to to get over it. And then you probably, be, yeah, I imagine there'll be loads of doubt, yeah, you know, questions as to what evidence has been provided before and things like that. Right. I think that's us in relation to the the questions. If then you know, unless there's any other comments that you'd like to share with us, but um, I would certainly say thank you very much to all three of you. Um, that certainly has given us food for thought over our uh, Easter break, as I think it was uh, James who mentioned that we'll be mulling it over. Um, I hope you've got something more interesting to think about than yeah. fresco over Easter. I have to say, <laughs> I, I feel sorry for you if that's. Uh... <laughs> Well, the terrible it. thing is, it's um, it's um, it's not esoteric uh, what we're what you've provided with because we are having to deal with it on a regular basis. As you mentioned, you're you're being asked to provide opinions on it and in relation to that, and it's adjudication is the dispute game in town, and uh, clients are very keen to find ways to either have it valued or not pay it or or anything like that. So it's all very topical, and of course, the insolvency is just uh, a minefield. Um, as are construction contracts which cover more than, than one so um, I would ask everyone to join me in thanking you but it would be silent applause but thank you very much on that um, as um, as we know uh, as mentioned the um, seminar has been recorded and the slides um, will be provided as well from Keaton Chambers so in early course they both will be on the CIR website for anyone who would like to have a look at them so Thank you very much, guys, and thank you to Keating Chamber. So we'll sign off. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. Cheers. Thanks.